nasty shoes and their plastic hats. Brunel was a showman with one eye always on the PR opportunity. So when he saw that every weekend thousands and thousands of people were coming to the east end of London to see how the tunnel was getting along, he realised he was running the greatest show on earth. The public eagerly consumed all the latest instalments from this East End drama. Every conceivable trinket and souvenir was manufactured, but there was nothing frivolous about building it. The roof kept collapsing. The investors must have thought they were pouring their money into a black hole. So, to keep the backers happy, he organised a lavish party down here. In today's terms, he'd have had Madonna and Guy, Hugh and Liz. Hello and OK magazines would have been fighting one another over the rights to publish the picture of Elton giving David a cheeky little hug. By day then, Brunel was risking his neck, but at night, he was schmoozing to save his face. Young Brunel nearly died in the tunnel, but it did nothing to diminish his appetite for a challenge. To the last, he was a complete workaholic. So what drove him? What was this precocious, prodigiously talented young chap really like? Well, he was a little man. And if you read through his diaries, which I have here, you can tell this bothered him. Even of a dark night, riding home when I pass some unknown person who perhaps does not even look at me, I catch myself trying to look big on my little pony. We can also tell he wasn't given to taking much in the way of time off. My birthday. Two steam pumps working hard, but pressure will not stop up. When the afternoon shift came on, they did not go below, but remained on top, grumbling about last week's wages. In fact, it seems there was only one thing that was capable of dragging him away from work. Sex. I have had, as I supposed most young men have had, numerous attachments, if they deserve the name. Devilish pretty Jack's girl. turn has appeared to me the true one. The sofa scenes must now appear to her, as to me, rather an excellent musician and a very sweet voice. She was a nice girl, and had she improved as a girl of her age ought to have done? Well... We'll never know, because he's cut out the rest of the page. There was, however, one preoccupation that he had which was even more important to him than drive, ambition, work, or even sex. Even though this is a lockable diary, and it was kept in a locked box far from prying eyes, he only ever wrote about it in a secret type of shorthand. The subject I'm talking about is money. I'm most terribly pinched for money, should barely receive enough to pay my debts, and I'm at this moment without a penny. Let the worst happen, unemployed, untalked of, penniless. My poor father would hardly survive the tunnel. Mark Brunel had done everything he possibly could to give young Isambard a good start in life. But he'd suffered terribly trying to provide for his family. The debts had mounted up and eventually he ended up in debtor's prison for three months. Now, I like to think that Isambard's burning desire to succeed was fueled by a need to right the wrongs that had been inflicted on his father. After his accident in the tunnel, Brunel came here to Bristol to convalesce. But he wasn't much good at lying around, so while he was here, he began to compete for the contract to build a bridge across one of Britain's deepest gorges. A daunting prospect. It was run as a competition and the entries flooded in, some more impractical than others. Brunel, who needless to say had never designed a bridge before, submitted four ideas. The leading civil engineer, Thomas Telford, was invited to judge the entries. He rejected all Brunel's ideas. In fact, he rejected everyone's ideas until he was asked to come up with a plan. This was it. And it's great, except building those enormous towers would have cost a fortune, and everyone in Bristol hated it. So in the end, Brunel won. And what did he think up for his winning design? Something classical? 
Baroque? Romantic? No. He wanted to give Bristol something exotic. The Battle of the Nile and stories filtering back from grand tours had fired everyone's interest in ancient Egypt. So that was the route he took. The design was one thing, but building it was something else. The Avon Gorge is 250 feet deep with sheer rock on either side. So getting building supplies from one side to the other was not easy. An iron bar, a thousand feet long, was suspended across the chasm so men and materials could make the precarious journey in a basket. Presumably, to dispel fears among his workmen, Brunel was the first to step into the basket. He was literally putting his life on the line for his beloved bridge. He called it my first child, my darling. And he would risk everything for it. Hold on, you've got. Can you give me some slack? Yeah. No, I can't go down. Unfortunately, when the basket got to about here, the rope snagged on a kink in the bar and Brunel was left dangling 200 feet above the River Avon. Now, if he'd had a pen and paper on him, I'm sure he would have invented a helicopter and been winched to safety. But he didn't. So he climbed out of the basket and to the amazement of everybody watching, got onto the iron bar, freed the rope, then got back into the basket again and carried on his way. He'd cheated death for a second time. Small wonder that one of the pubs named in his honour in the centre of Bristol is called the Reckless Engineer. The basket was another fabulous publicity stunt. It speaks volumes for the man, even with today's rigorous safety standards. Now look, something isn't... I'm sure... I didn't see it do this on the way over. It's still pretty hairy. Oh, well, oh my God, stop it! Look, stop that! Why is it shaking so much? Stop it, right, stop, stop, stop now! This is just ridiculous. He arrived at the other side completely unscathed, but tragically Brunel's darling bridge would not be completed until after his death. Nevertheless, with one stroke of genius, he defined a city. As we've seen, though, he was no one-hit wonder. While he was in Bristol, he also set about redesigning the harbour. In London, he was building another suspension bridge over the Thames. The tunnel underneath it was inching along. He was also doing the docks in Sunderland, designing his first ship and... He got married. Mary Horsley was a society beauty from a cultured family. Mendelssohn would drop by for tea and buns. Mary's brother John was a famous painter. Brunel was smitten. For their honeymoon, they went to Snowdonia in Wales. It was a whistle-stop tour, and one suspects that Isambard might not have given Mary his undivided attention. He was just a little preoccupied with his latest venture. The railway had arrived. At first, trains were simply used to move coal, the fuel that powered the empire. And by the time Brunel came along, there were tracks dotted all over the industrial north of England, from Liverpool to Manchester, from Darlington to Stockport, from Birmingham to London even. Brunel saw what was happening and thought, I can do much better than this. 
And so he began work on what would become